Hello, everybody. This is the College of Complexes. And you all here? We searched the word. Okay. Do you remember? No, no, no. Hello? Yeah. We have a very important role here at the College of Complexes, and that, that is one fool at a time, so that we can all hear what's being said. Why don't you get the mic? Okay. On? It's on. It's on. It's on. But it's so good high tech that uh, you cannot detect it except that you can hear the speaker. That pipe down, Susan, there. Uh, uh, all right. Now, we have with us tonight Rod Baton, uh, who has spoken here before. Uh, he uh, will be speaking about the 2011-12 elections and what is really at stake. Now, Ron uh, uh, represents uh, or uh, speaks for uh, the uh, LaRouche uh, Political Action Committee, uh, so uh, he has a few axes to grind and uh, he has also uh, spoken for one of their pet projects, the Nawapa, uh, which is uh, a, a project to import water uh, from uh, the Yukon River and some other northern uh, rivers flowing into the Arctic into the uh, southwest of the United States and uh, uh, the dry parts of Canada. Okay, without any further ado, then we will hear from Ron Batag. Okay. As was said in the introduction, my name is Ron Betag. I do organize with Lyndon LaRouche. Um, in the kind of a agenda items that are up there monthly, uh, as I've put these things up, there have been links. Like last time I was here, we discussed the WAPA. I don't know if people have gone on there and looked at some of those films. Um, we can go into that again in questions. There's also been a series of um, discussions, uh, webcasts, LaRouche started last week, last Friday night, coming off of the um, Benghazi situation and especially off the last election. And then the second one was last night, people can get on the site, it's LaRouchePack.com. And this is an ongoing discussion with the nation uh, interfacing the world on the actual financial situation and military situation we face. because. If we look at these elections, we tend to look at them as ball games. There's a set game, there's a couple of teams coming up, two majors, maybe some minors, and it gets lost in the, the spin. And uh, although that's scheduled to come up in a couple of weeks, there's actually agendas on our schedule which are a little bit bigger and actually setting uh, what is going to um, determine politics. The election is quite secondary in the politics of the world. And two things on the agenda I'd like to, to lay out. Many of you follow these things. The problem is most Americans don't follow it in a willful manner, that they actually feel that they have a role to play in changing it. And number one is that the entire financial situation, the entire um, banking system of, uh, of Europe, the inter-alpha system, which the United States is tied into with Wall Street or whatever, it's in a hyperinflationary blowout collapse bigger than 1923 in Germany. And it was, that blowout in Germany was, uh, as we talked last time, was contained in one country pretty much. This one's global. And everything connected to that, the derivatives, the derivatives on the derivatives, 
you see the austerity in Europe creating all these kinds of uh, situations of the Arab Springs and the, the Greek situation and whatever. All these austerity pushes at the same time you have the hyperinflationary principle push. Neither one of those, looting people to death, papering it over, everybody at the top through the whole system knows it cannot work. It is not working. It's got the entire world on a financial blowout and what we would call World War III. And I'm going to get into that as the second point because the financial structures, the British Empire that control that bubble, in no way want a Russia, a China, the Pacific Theater, which is still in a process of development, more and more on a credit system as LaRouche lays out. There's no way like before World War I, that this British Empire wants that kind of development in a particular region undercutting their control of the situation. So they need a face-off with Russia and China in that Pacific area before the crash. And the crash is on them now. So if you look at the war situation in that light, that you have orchestrated wars being created as triggers like in World War I to set this bigger thing off. And if you think back a little bit, we're going to revisit a couple of uh, crime scenes here tonight, and we're going to go deeper and deeper into the crime. Um, because one obvious crime that's on the table and now blowing up in their face and they can't put it back in a box, we can go through some details on this, is the Libyan situation, is the Benghazi situation, the attempt to cover that up and lie about it, that cover being blown, and then the cover of the, of the cover up being blown. And that's now in congressional hearings, and especially this last Tuesday and Wednesday. What it has actually done is, for the first time, beginning to break this entire controlled environment that's been around the elections for a number of years in the United States, and especially specifically in this one. Where, if you watch the last debate, the invincible delusion that uh, Barack Obama is X, Y, and Z when the whole underbelly of this thing is coming out. And what I want to get into is not only the danger we presently face in a World War III, removing Obama for cause on the war, either in impeachment before the election or in the election, leaves us with a similar situation with the Romney and other people calling for the same wars and with no economic policy. So if you look at what we actually face, we have a nation, we've had discussion upon discussion, debate, now a vice president debate, and what's often the case is what's missing. There, there, there was no discussion in any of the, uh, the campaigns or in the debates or in the media about this hyperinflationary blowout situation because we're dealing with an empire that actually is moving to knock out nation states. And there's many ways you can take down a nation and look at the United States since the takedown of Kennedy and then Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. We really haven't done anything economically or politically in a sane manner in the right direction. It actually dealt with something like a Roosevelt or a Lincoln since. And the population Realizing that lack of leadership has more and more run themselves into entertainment and how do I get by and how do I get smaller. And some of the things we're going to discuss tonight might get a little scary at some levels, but the key thing is it's understandable and there's also solutions to fix it, but we have to fix it in a specific way by coming back to the United States Constitution. And that is we immediately have to go through a Glass-Steagall bankruptcy reorganization, so we separate this bubble of paper from the real, that puts us in a situation then where it's obvious we have more bogus monopoly money than anything real. So you need a credit system like the United States was formed where the government as a principled discussion of leadership, not parties, but the leadership of the country. You might have leaders come up through the parties, but once you get to the discussion, it's got to be about the nation, where the nation's going to go, where the city's going to go. It's got to be a governmental discussion, not a political party ball team discussion. So it's not a winner-take-all kind of silliness that's going on. So if you look at that, we get a credit system, then we have to credit things that actually put people to work doing real things. So this Nawapa plan that 
was mentioned a little earlier that we talked about last week. This huge water system that would divert 20% of the Yukon and Mackenzie through the Rockies, irrigating the west in tunnel systems and reservoir systems, it's literally 360 different projects ready to go. They've been ready to go since Jack Kennedy was shot. So we put that back to work that would be, as we talked last time, an immediate gear up of needed skilled work and then you could feed the semi-skilled and the youth training programs under that. There's literally 14 million jobs right there. And that's not even talking about the power systems and the transportation systems and all the jobs that would spin up in Detroit and Chicago with the machine tool capability again. But that kind of driver is what's got to be on the agenda. So we need the best, whether they come from the independents, the Democrats, the Republicans, we need the best people picked in the nation coming out of this next period that puts that policy in place. And that's the only subject on the table, and we as people have to be part of creating that. It's the same thing around the world. You're not going to fix Greece. You're not going to fix Tunisia. You're not going to fix any of these places unless we get a global Glass-Steagall and a credit policy in those nations that start building those projects that those nations need. Water systems, irrigation systems, transportation systems, health systems. I mean, look at this world and the amount of work that has to be done. So there is no excuse for what's going on in this campaign so far. No excuse. Linda LaRouche has been on the scene. It's all over their website. All these politicians know it. Now what started happening this last week, as people know, the ambassador of uh, Libya, you know, there in uh, uh, Benghazi, was assassinated, and the immediate story was that it was a, due to this film, it was a demonstration that went bad, got ugly, turned violent, and caused all this. Well, if people have been following this, they now know that, one, they knew from the beginning it was a armed, probably Al-Qaeda, another network attack uh, on 9-11, consciously deployed, knowing that it was coming, all kinds of warnings. The British had shut down their consulate. Red Cross had pulled out. The security teams had demanded. All this is now in the congressional record from these meetings this last week. And yet, you have people on national television, like Susan Rice, saying for six days after it happened, it was about the film, it was about this, whatever. Well, they have films now, 50-minute films, that prove there never was a demonstration. So it's all a lie. So the question is, what is going on when you have this kind of structure going into place and running these kinds of lies and even attempting to continue those lies now? What is going on? Who needs these wars? So if you look at this crime I just mentioned, that there was a conscious complicity in setting up the situation and taking down this embassy, that was conscious. That's a crime that was committed. But as Kucinich, the congressman at the hearing said, you can't really look at this crime unless you look at it only happened because we as a nation illegally toppled a government and executed a, a president of another nation. These are Nuremberg criminal war operations. So how did that happen? So he's now posing that bigger question that the question of the illegal wars have to be brought into the question. Which again comes to a, an Obama policy for the British. You look at the war policy that's going on right now in Syria. We are arming the entire Al-Qaeda bunch in Syria. Might have some cutouts there so they can't trace it. But you have Turkey in a now 10-day battle with Syria, supported by the Saudis, supported by the British, and whatever. Well, how did they get that fight started with Turkey? Well, there was fi shots fired into Turkey. They say the Syrians did it. Well, the Syrians have actually successfully contained that opposition, which is mostly foreigners in Syria, fighting to topple that government like they toppled the Syria, I mean, Libya. So now they're beginning to put that down in Aleppo and other places. Now, as you're consolidating that, as one American now, uh, military officials said, why in that situation would the Syrians be so stupid as an army and as a nation to bomb Turkey and cause an incident with NATO? 
So if you think back to World War II and other wars, Vietnam War, how they got started, you create incidences to kick certain things off. So you have the opposition probably funded by these players strike Turkey and get the strike back. So you got now nine days of confrontation going on. A plane was just taken down, a Syria plane, forced down, wasn't shot down. Coming from Russia, going to Syria, 32 passengers, radar equipment, but the Turks say it's got weapons. We're going to take it. So you have a forced downing of a plane, international incident. As we speak here right now, you've got top you know, military meetings going on with our own chief of staff, like they've been meeting for the last year trying to cool this thing out, General Dempsey and others. You have the Russians in special meetings. Everybody out there in the military layer is trying to cool this lunacy off. But yet it's got this driver. Why does it have the driver? Because this financial network that's crashing needs a war. They need to back everything down and take the austerity. No ifs, bans, ands, buts, whatever. It's the same thing in the United States with the budget cuts here. And see, as long as we as people stay within this box and say, well, it's the blue team or the red team, and both teams are pushing budget cuts. So can you tell us why can't they do it without a war? Why do they need a war? Can you clarify uh, that? Time. Uh, we can get to that in the questions, but it's, the, they got to crush the resistance. You can't have a nation like the United States did under Roosevelt come to its senses and say, we're not going the, right, the route of Italy with Mussolini. We're not going to go the route of Germany with Hitler. Roosevelt actually came in saying, we're not going to let the bankers run it. We're going to actually direct credit into production. And we created the conditions to build out of it. We had it. It was far enough gone to use a war to do it, but you don't need a war to do it. They need the war to break and realign the political operations and realign the control of money. They can write off a lot of money if they're reorganizing the structure that you're going to create the aftermath of the control. So they want to come out of this thing with that kind of control, even though it probably means, and it's actually what they call for, a reduction of the population down to a billion or so, so people. It's a population reduction agenda. So if you look at the death of Roosevelt, you look at Truman and then it went on the British policy. We got the, the whole situation there with uh, you know, the bombing of Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima at the end of the war, a policy we didn't need, we can get into that. But you have literally the policies of Roosevelt from then on, except for the attempts of Kennedy, Eisenhower, Bitt, and Kennedy to go back the other way. The United States, as I said earlier, has been going downhill ever since, closing down production, closing down skill capabilities, dumbing down the population, but it's not accidental. There's a policy that's been doing it. And what's been running the political forces, and this is where I want to get into this control of the parties, the parties have been designed, designed and run not to get into those kinds of subjects, which is the whole reason for the blackout of LaRouche, who in 1971, when we were forced off the gold standard, and he's the only guy that laid out it was coming and what you had to do about it, everything he said for the last 40 years is now obvious. So what's the problem with the way we think that we can't throw off the idiotities and just put the situation through a bankruptcy reorganization and build out of this? Because the ideologies, the way we think, the political party structure, the ball key, the go along to get along, it's what runs Congress, go along to get along. I agree with what you're saying, but I, I'm a team player. And it's the same with the population. I know what you're talking about, but you know I'm I look a little funny if I say that. Why don't we compromise and get X, Y, and Z done? So we've gone through another whole election here where you're facing a situation where on the one hand we have the Democrats supporting Barack Obama who is a serial violator of the U.S. Constitution on the, on the, um, on the war question. He's a serial violator of the Constitution on the question of the health program and this T4 policy of the, the uh, the same Nazi program in terms of these, Romney at least called him out on that, these committees to uh, make the budget cuts on who gets care or not. But you go through every one of these policies, the, the National uh, def, you know, Defense Authorization Board, all these kinds of police structures, this fact that we have 12 people making decisions on the budget and just cross the board cutting whatever they want to cut. All this austerity mentality, you come down to Romney Manual here and 
Preckwinkle or whatever, this notion that you've got to cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget. Every time you cut it, you make the situation worse. Every time you cut grease, you make it worse. What do they need? They need massive credit and infrastructure for development. What do we need in Chicago and every city in the country and every state? We need a government-directed credit, like Roosevelt did, putting the nation to work. And you get a tax base and you can fund all these things. But see, the discussion never gets outside the box. And they'll pick vicious fights, getting people to fight two sides of the box. They'll have labor fighting management and teachers fighting the school board. And both of them have been looted to the bone by these LIBOR operations. But nobody takes that on. We give them $30 trillion in bailouts. So the question I think we've got to get to tonight, and it's, it's the reason I, I laid this out, that the only issue on the table, because way before the election, the war issue's on the table, right now as we speak. Way before the election, this financial crash could happen at any point. So the question is, what is going to intervene in politics at that moment, as Baruch has been laying out, that we freeze this entire mountain of paper and you're directing credit in these projects that uh, fulfill this thing. So what you have is a situation where you got to pick layers and individuals in all walks of life, like a, like a Roosevelt did, a Franklin Roosevelt. Who was his chief guy but Wallace? Wallace was a Republican. All right? You can be on the whole list. It's got nothing to do with parties, and we've got we to cut it out, or we're going to lose. So the question on the table right now, if you look at what we're facing in the election, and I can throw it open to questions, is if Barack Obama is re-elected President of the United States, you are going to get that thermonuclear war either before or after he's elected. And the problem you face is that if he thinks he's losing, it would energize him to do it now which is what's going on, and if he thinks he's winning, he would be energized to do it now. And the problem is, is we've got a whole gaggle of political layers who know and more and more that that's the case, and relatively few have the guts to say it. Just in the last week, you had Kucinich come out beginning to pose to that, you have Rand Paul, kind of a interesting place where it came from, coming out on this bigger war question. But see, what we've got to do is, one, draw the line. The Democrats should have not nominated him. We should have opened up another uh, avenue. We didn't do that. So if Obama's removed, if we did it in the 25th Amendment right now, we started the impeachment like we should, then that war danger ends immediately. Because there is no other force in the world that is going to start that thermonuclear war except Barack Obama for the British. He's the only narcissist that's completely committed to that. And that's what came out on the debates on, on Tuesday, where people saw for the first time the shell that this guy is, and that he's a straight narcissist. It's always been ego, there's never been there anything in the first place. There's been no content, we've been deluding ourselves, and we've got to stop it now. Now the other side of this thing is when you elect, or say a Romney or somebody else goes in, whoever goes in, cannot be the party going in, because the Republican Party is just as ideologically fascist with its you know, budget cuts as the Democrats are acting under Obama. So you can't have either one if you elect anybody. I don't care if they're a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, a Mason, whatever. When they walk into that office, they are President of the United States, and it's a leadership question of the country. They don't answer to a party, they answer to the nation. So we as citizens, have to get ourselves up and start to drawing the line also on the Constitution. On the question is, what is the content of the policy? What are we going to do? And we come back to three things that we're either going to do as we remove this war situation with Kirby Obama, is we're going to put through Glass-Steagall, which is before the Congress, House Bill 1489, it's ready to go. You put that through, you separate the real from the bogus, and you're in a position to immediately gear up like Roosevelt did. Secondly, we need this credit policy, a third national bank, which allows, again, the United States to direct the credit in anything we choose to do. We only have one criteria. We have to make sure it's something real. We actually have to come back to science. We've got to give up 
the zero growth, the green crap, all this thing that takes people backwards, and we've got to go to thermonuclear fusion and higher energies, levels of energy flux density. We've got to actually create a situation. It's an interesting project we've been working on. Teller started it way back. You look at the asteroids we have in the, uh, in the near orbits. Any one of those things can begin hitting us. We've got to have a capability power-wise and knowing where they are to deal with them. So those become the drivers like NOAPA that puts the entire skill level of the United States and the world to work. So we're going to have a skilled labor shortage. We have, we can take millions of these young people, put them under Army Corps of Engineers and tie it to a training program on NOAPA and, and, the, and the water project as we talked last time. But that issue is now not delayed. We talked three months ago, I laid out, as LaRouche is saying, this is the issue, this should be what we're talking about, and everybody went to sleep. And the problem is, is now we're in that war situation. And the only reason we have not had that thermonuclear face-off is because of General Dempsey, our own chief of staff, that has been countering Obama on this and his whole crew. You've got um, the Russians and the, the Chinese and others. And I mean, if people don't, I mean, I can show maps and things that go through some of this, but one, I mean, we have literally Russia and China surrounded as they're moving with the hourglass subs and all this. But one thing I wanted to read, um, and then I'll throw it open. There's a guy by the name of David Rothkop. He um, floated the suggestion on October the 8th from within the Obama administration um, that Obama should actually revive his sagging poll numbers <coughs> after losing the recent debate by opening, openly working with Israel towards a U.S.-Israeli joint strike in Iran. Quote, now he's quoting, even some of the president's supporters have told me privately that they wonder about this uh, commitment and that of a U.S. military taking action against Iran. And he says, according to those sources close to the ongoing Israeli-U.S. discussions, the action that participants currently see as most likely is a joint U.S.-Israeli surgical strike targeting Iran and Richmond facilities. The strike might take only a couple hours, in the best case, and only would involve a day or two over, overall, of source that, and could be conducted by air, using primarily bombers and drone support. Advocates for this support argue that not only is it likely to be more politically palatable to the United States, but were it to be successful, meaning knocking out the enrichment facilities, setting the Iranian nuclear program back many years, and doing so without civilian casualties, it would have region-wide benefits. One advocate asserts that it would have a transformative outcome, saving Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, reanimating the peace process, securing the Gulf, sending the unequivocal message to Russia and China, and assuring the American ascendancy in the region for decades to come. Insane. Now what we can do is shift the policy to the Constitution, freeze the paper with Glass-Steagall, direct credit or have that ready to go, begin putting 14 million people to work as we gear up the infrastructure, and create the basis where we're actually educating our future to be able to handle even more than that. Because the transitions we're actually sitting on as we get beyond using thermonuclear capabilities for weapons and war, well, let's use thermonuclear fusion for the, the kinds of benefits and plasma torches and, and energy and whatever. We're at a threshold point in this election to come back to the ball game. The problem is, except on LaRouche's side and what he's put on the table and brought more and more people, most, a lot of people are talking about this behind the scenes, but it's only Lynn that's drawing it in public. And the population's got to come in on this. And you can go on the site and get a lot of this. But think through the election. Look, think through the entire campaign. Name me one thing that's actually shaken anybody's world up that we've got to do something different. And you look at the debates, at least it had a, a, a semblance of that where it started shaking some of the controlled environment. But rather than going on, it's sometimes easier to get to some of these questions. But the question is, we have an agenda facing the human race on this financial crash and the war, and that that reality 
does not allow us to put a Barack Obama back in, knowing what he is over the last four years and what he will become as an hero, even more. And we cannot tolerate any other policy that's presently been discussed by the roundies, whatever, in terms of economic policy. It's got to be Glass-Steagall credit and development. And Russia, China, all the nations of the world are already fully fighting for that with us. And if you ever wonder why LaRouche is controversial, that's what he's been leading for the last 40 years. And they thought they could box it all out. And reality creates the situation where ideas have this kind of power. We don't have to be the biggest force in the nation. It's got to be a clear voice now changing everything. And like Roosevelt, like Lincoln, we can actually do that. So we can solve the Middle East, we can build water projects, we can irrigate, we can pull things together as opposed to this empire playing everything against each other and tearing it apart. So I'll leave it there and um, we'll go on. All right. Hey. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, we'll start with Don Ritchie. Okay. All right, my question is... Okay. Loud Don. Who do you plan to vote for for president this year? Well, we've waited so long that to right now there isn't a candidate. And like, just relax. You're still in the ball game. Somebody's got to win. It's got to be one of these two guys. I don't care if the world goes to hell. We blow ourselves up. It's got to be one of these two guys. And really, it has nothing to do with what we just said. What we just said was the United States has to change the policy. So the subject is, how do we use our own capabilities to change the policy, get some content? Lyndon LaRouche, three weeks ago, turned 90 years old. Lyndon LaRouche, if you check him out on his webcast, is still operating at 90 to 95 hours a week. He just uh, did a prep, you know, webcast. People think back and they, uh, they know a little bit about Roosevelt and the fireside chats. Well, Lyndon LaRouche on his website on Monday and Tuesday has a network of candidates we ran. There's a discussion with them in terms of policy and how do we change and educate the population on this. Every Monday for at least an, an hour. Wednesday there's a discussion on the policy and the science and how do we implement this future. It's called the weekly report. And on Fridays for the last two weeks, like I said, there's a discussion on the webcast out to everybody exactly what we face and how do we change this. So the question is, how do we get some content? We may end up with a Romney. We may end up with, you know, uh, a reaction in a Green Party candidate. We may end up with, uh, with a, a stalemate. We cannot have the war, so you cannot put Obama back in as a Nero. He is, if you look at history in terms of the grandiosity gap in his notion of who he is, he's a Nero. The only thing going on in his head is this identity that he's created. Now the question is, how do we, even whoever gets elected, do we have enough of a political force that whoever goes in has the same agenda? The last Steagall goes through because the population will not tolerate anything less. We're not going to run it by a party. We're not going to have the Austrian school of economics that says budget cuts, budget cuts, kill people. We have 20, what is it, 27 million people unemployed. People living at, you know, on a level of literally dying off. And we're going to run another austerity program on top of that like they're doing in Greece and whatever. This is Nazi stuff. And we kind of God, it can't be that bad. Well, we know it is. That's the denial. That's the ball games. That's the razzle-dazzle. I'm going to vote for my team no matter what. Cut it out. Okay. Um, a number of times while you were answering, uh, while you were not... No. I'm sorry, okay. but I'm calling... Oh, no, he pointed at me. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Hand up. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, you uh, are doing Gary Dolman is next. Who is? Yeah. Gary Dolman, I'm trying uh, to... Sir, Ron, you made an assessment about what you... Uh, made an assessment about what will happen if Obama is reelected. What do you assess will happen if Romney is elected? Well, the difference here <coughs> is the fact that there are two different kinds of British agents. You have Obama is a created kind of agent out of these Tavistock operations, which 
he was picked up and groomed for what he is. I mean, people can look at the um, the fundraising. I mean, there's another report out, 108-page um, section on Obama in it. That there's something like by the end of the month, it'll be a half a billion dollars in money, $200 or less that have come through credit card uh, accounts. Many of them, like with this guy Roach from uh, Singapore, 65% of his people are overseas operations, right? Now there's nothing on his website that allows you to make a distinction between whether you're foreigner or domestic, whether you're a citizen or not. There's no criteria to uh, get a code validating the, uh, the, the uh, credit card or even like a, you know, there's just no accountability. And Obama himself has a, a, a message out to people saying, I need you all to give contributions $190 or less. What's this thing about $200 or less? Well, if it's under $200, there's no accounting for it. And since he's not taking FEC money, there never will be an accounting for it. So if you look at this, you look at what put him in last time, the thuggery, whatever, in terms of this razzle-dazzle that was created with no real content then either. And the same thing today, no content with either side, Romney the same thing. Now, so Obama's tied to that kind of crowd and the whole network that created it. I can go through more details on that. On the Romney side, most of the Republicans, at least, you know, like a Rand Paul and Romney and all these guys, what is their economic policy but this Austrian school of economy, which is really the old fascist based out of Austria, of there is no role for government in, in, uh, uh, in uh, economics. That there, these guys actually argue that the minimum wage is illegal. Because who has the right to say to a business, you have to pay a certain amount? The guy wants the job or not? I can pay him dirt if he takes dirt? Well, then that's it. They even argue against Social Security. They, so, just to answer your question, Romney's a different kind of operative because he's not in the immediate danger on the war, although he is for the wars. The danger we have with Obama immediately is a nuclear first strike. Thank you. Neil? Uh, yeah, what I tried to uh, ask before is you never really answered Don's question. You just got off into some more rhetoric. Could you please answer Don's question? Who am I going to vote for? Or which one of these two I would vote for? Which, well, to answer the answer, which, 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 which of these two you would well, vote no, for? Well, no, my question was actually, it could be any candidate, because there's more than two candidates. Yeah, well, we never really got an answer to that yeah. Okay. If there is no policy there, why would you vote for him? Why don't you change the policy so you don't die? But no, we're not getting that question answered. Who would you vote for? Maybe... It's not a question because it doesn't deal with reality. If you ask me which guy should I pick on the Chicago Sox or the Cubs that can um, solve the school system problem in Chicago, well, I'm not going to answer your question because That's they're playing good. ball. That's a good question, though. Go ahead and answer it. <laughs> they're playing ball. They're not in the subject. Right. Right. Charles? Yeah, right. Now, Obama got us out of the war in Iraq, and then they're debating there and even said we're going to get out of the Afghanistan by 2014. And you come along and you say, this is the guy that got us getting us out of two wars, and you're saying he's going to start another one? Where did those troops that came out of Iraq go? Well, I don't really know, but they're not in Iraq. That's all I know. Right? Well, you don't even know that, but a good portion of them came out of Iraq and they went into Jordan. And what have they been doing in Jordan? They've been training an opposition to deal with Syria. They're on the border right now. So you have a <coughs> Turkish operation on the one side to topple the government of a nation another sovereign nation. I mean, this is Nuremberg stuff. And you have the Jord Jordanians with American backing running an operation from the Jordan side, and you've got the similar situation run somewhat from the Iranian side. Um, the, the question is, what is conducting the permanent warfare in light of the financial crash? 
And this is where people have to look at who is the actual enemy. This is when I said earlier, we're going to visit, revisit a couple of crime scenes. The crime scene of Benghazi is like the crime scene at 9-11. And the 9-11 situation, there's 28 pages still that have got to be forced public that demonstrate the Saudi Arabian uh, uh, Prince Bandar, who was the ambassador to the United States in England at the time, one of the key operatives that set up the logistics and the financing of that 9-11 operation. That is still intact. In fact, Bandor is right now the chief of intelligence of Saudi Arabia running a lot of this stuff. So when you say Obama got us out of a couple of wars, you're closer to war than ever in thermonuclear war. Well, well follow up. All they said was Benghazi, they're going to go get the guys who did it. Oh. Is that going to require a war? And yeah, this is not 9-11. Why do we have the situation is we created it. We created it. We toppled a government and executed their leader. We committed a crime against humanity, which was brought before Nuremberg. So let's cut it out. Burning the honey. Yes, uh, you alluded to the uh, Return to Prudent Banking Act of 2011, uh, House Bill 1489. Doing a quick search on this, it looks like there's currently 83 members of the House of Representatives that are on board sponsoring this. Could you tell us a little bit more about, the, about this bill? Well, it basically reinstates the bill, what people know as the Glass-Steagall Act from uh, Roosevelt, put through by Glass and Steagall back in 33, which makes, separates commercial bank and, and um, <coughs> speculative banks. You can't be either. So it actually creates a situation where, again, not only are we running our own credit into these big projects, but we literally take all those gambling debts, these derivatives that we've been bailing out to 30 trillion and so, takes it off our books, puts it back on their books. And that's when they immediately scream, well, everything will go under. Let them go under. We don't need these gambling houses. I see you, Pat. Right? Does that answer your question? All right. Yes, uh, Andy Anderson. Yes, Ron. Uh, you keep saying you know, we should change policies rather than worry about who to vote for. We have to change the policies. Well, we have three weeks before the election. Now, short of taking up weapons and just going out and killing politicians in a violent revolution, what do you suggest we collectively do to change the policy? The CEOs. Well, the immediate policy that has to be changed is what, we got to. What should we do? We have to stop this war cold. How? One, there's a House Bill uh, 107, House uh, Current Resolution 107, which ba it's by uh, Walter Jones, a Republican from uh, North Carolina, which basically says no president is allowed to start a war on his own. It's an unconstitutional, it's, it's crimes, you know, against the Constitution, against humanity. So if you implement that bill, he is presently not only guilty of that, he is presently actively violating it again. So there can be a, an emergency session right now, which is beginning to start on these hearings. It was brought up in a couple places. But see, rather than talk about it, the congressmen are home campaigning. They're not even in session right now. Right. right. we got to run their butts back there, and they got to put through the, see, these kind of political issues or political issues, not the election. If you get any of them back, and we've already lost these fights, so what? You lose the nation, and you, you, we, we elected our guy, though. You know, he's playing shortstop next year, but we don't have next year. <clears throat> what, my right. question is, with no policy change, what's the difference between Obama and Romney? Romney will continue to follow the same policies as Bush did. We right, have, and like have, Obama's followed the same policy yeah. as Bush. So we got to change on these two fronts. One, on the removal of the war danger, you have to take Obama off the button, because that's the danger. He sits on those Iowa-class submarines that can do a lot of damage. And if you remove him, then the British have no access the British Empire has no access to our nuclear capability. Secondly, you've got to put through Glass-Steagall so that no matter who goes in, the policy is this credit policy. Pat Butler. So we have to change the policy by tolerating nothing less. Okay. Okay. Yeah, a couple questions. Uh, you spoke at least three times of us being on the brink of World War III. Can you outline for us the lineup of the belligerents on each side 
and what reasons they would have for taking that position. And uh, number two, uh, you spoke of the president prosecuting an unconstitutional war uh, without the consent of uh, Congress. Uh, isn't there a difference between prosecuting a war and going after a ragtag band of bandits and terrorists who happen to be in Afghanistan uh, but aren't being dealt with as a recognized army representing a recognized sovereign state? You cited several times uh, international law in the Constitution. Doesn't international law, I believe the Geneva Accords, uh, do not require us to treat individuals out of uniform, caught in arms, uh, not recognized by any sovereign state. Uh, we're not obligated to extend to them the same uh, protections under the Geneva Accords that we would if we were dealing with, if we were at war with Germany or even at war with Japan or wherever. Uh, there's a difference, is there not, between the soldiers of a sovereign state and a band of bandits? Okay, on the first question, um, this actual drive for war, again, not separate from the financial crash because that's what's driving the need for the war. When we went illegally into Libya, toppled a government, and then executed their head of state, no matter what you think of it, and that's what we did, the game plan at that point, since the bigger fight was get the back down of Russia and China, the game plan for the British and Obama's agenda at that point was to use that, no trial, that's why they killed him, run this thing directly against Syria and uh, Iran, get a bigger face off, just hit them and hit them and hit them, get the back down. What intervened in that process last fall was when Gaddafi was killed, LaRouche said the reason for the execution is to block a trial to get that kind of driver, and he put out the international call that this is about a created war, like the orchestration of World War I on these economic questions. Russia responded to that, you know, first Medvedev and then uh, Putin. Uh, you have the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the United States under Dempsey responded to that, and the Chinese responded to that. And the question of global war and drawing the line against that successfully blocked that from becoming an actual full war. Because, so that side of it, the belligerence in this or the Russians and the Chinese, especially the Russians, saying we are not going to have another toppling like in Libya, another violation of sovereignty, because they're not stupid. They know that they're the target. All these rings of weapons around China and around Russia in terms of these placement, these missions, they're all geared to knock out their second strike. So the belligerence in this is the British Empire through their puppet Obama, and he's crazy enough to do it. So the second part of your question, is it bags the whole question of where did Al-Qaeda come from in the first place? We had the Russians suckered into Afghanistan. And what did we do? We ran around to all the Saudi and other layers and we organized anti-atheist communist young people to become a, an army against the Russians in Afghanistan. And that worked until they got run out of Afghanistan and they dismantled a lot of that when they shut down the uh, BCCI bank. But about 10% stayed in place as an international operation for hire. And it's been running through all these circles, funded and run and educated by the Saudis in this British Empire operation. You look at all these radicals, they come out of Saudi-funded operations and, and British operations in a gang counter gang operation. And we've been suckered into that. George Bush Sr. was in that. It's been every, it's been a dominant playing role in, in the United States ever since. We should actually come clean on that. And the best way to do that is publicize these 28 pages of that 9 11 report, as um, Senator um, Graham is laying out, Bob Graham, he's got a book on this, he was part of the both committees. 28 pages of detail down to check stubs, Prince Bondor and the Saudis fi financing some of the pilots uh, that were involved in 9-11. But look at 9-11 as something bigger, a Reichstag fire operation, create a crisis to get a lockdown. And they would have pulled a couple of them back then, but LaRouche was on 
public radio at the time that morning, and you can get the transcript of what he said then, blowing a lot of this way back then. Okay. This is a lot of public record. Tim All right. Bulger. As a follow-up, you said we're going to have thermonuclear war if Obama's re-elected. Can you be specific as to maybe a time frame when the button might be pushed? We'll look at some dynamics. You presently have, as this last week, you have Turkey firing for eight and nine days across the border into in Syria. And Syria is a backed up and allied, but not only the Russians and the Chinese. Now, what is Turkey? Well, Turkey is a member of NATO. So you now have, in this situation, you have NATO squared off against Russia. Now, the last time we were in this situation, Cuban Missile Crisis, at least you had somebody of the quality of a Kennedy who walked through the situation, gave Khrushchev a couple of options. We actually made some deals to pull back some of our missiles in Turkey, whatever. And we got the thing solved because anybody who is a rational human being especially since the 50s and the 60s on, realizes with what we have in terms of nuclear capability and thermonuclear capability, that if you start that kind of war, it's the extinction of the planet. So sane people say, you can't start that war. Now we've got some people in governments that aren't governed by that. Obama's one of them. Netanyahu in, uh, in Israel is one of those, in a flight forward for the strike against Iran, and he's being edged on by the British and, and Obama as well. Get these things going. What do they think? Like the guy says, it's only going to take two days to hit them. Or you got, there's various layers in Turkey saying, look, we got the capability with the Turkey's army to go to Damascus in three days. Yeah, you're right. Three hours. Mike Foley. So, what problems does Barack Obama have that would cause him to start a nuclear war? And how would nuclear war solve the problem that he has that would cause him to start it? Well, it obviously wouldn't solve his problem, except that, um, you know, some Nero-type personalities do commit suicide when their war falls apart. We just well, have to make sure that... Everything doesn't go with him. Now, to answer your question, he's a narcissist, as LaRouche has been laying out since a couple of uh, weeks into his presidential campaign. If you look at his personality, he is a spitting image, and Lynn makes the case, We've other people have made the case, he's, he's a narcissist. Not just a narcissist who thinks about himself a bit more than somebody else, has a big ego, but he's a malignant narcissist who has no connection emotionally to other people. Is that what caused him to start a nuclear war? What is causing the nuclear war is this big game of bluff he's running as a Nero. What causes Barack Obama to use drones to execute on a regular basis, you know, individuals, you know, funeral wedding parties, funeral parties, even American citizens? So what, what is that? That's not a human response. There is a valid, legitimate reason why that's being done. There is not. Yes, there is. What? The war in Afghanistan is being conducted to make Afghanistan a place safe for the Central Intelligence Agency to steal all the heroin in Afghanistan and sell it around the world. That is the function of the war in Afghanistan. Yeah. It is a heroin war. So the CIA can control the heroin that is grown in Afghanistan. You're right, except for one point. It's the British version and, and f faction of the CIA. All right. uh, Peter Anonymous. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Obama was a British agent. Could you clarify this? Well, if you look at, you know who George Soros is? Yes. George Soros is the biggest pusher of the legalization of drugs. He's the biggest... Uh, conduit of money into the Obama campaign in the first election. Um, you have a, an oligarchical worldview. If you look at Obama, you look at some of the things he's done and said at the Queen's presence. He's, he's not, I mean, they have this whole image that he's a real bright guy, but you see what happens when there's no teleprompter and the, the script is not totally orchestrated. The guy is not, um, in control of 
of himself, really, that he has no content to actually deliver. There's no policy in what he said. People kind of, it's like a soap opera. People feed in the policy they want to hear. I watch the soap opera and I get all emotionally charged, but you're putting your own emotions into the soap opera. They just manipulate your emotions. And what you have with these candidates is the same thing. You came out of a number of years, eight years of Bush and Cheney, you wanted something different, and here's a guy saying change and hope. What was the content? Nothing. Did we demand any content? No. And what's the British connection? Isn't he just uh, you know, an empty American guy? Who... Well, not the British people, the empire, the Queen, Prince Philip, this whole structure that runs, Royal Dutch Shell, British Petroleum, Monsanto, the grain cartels, the drug cartels, the banking cartels, I mean, the Americans have to take a real deep breath and, you know, look at Rip Van Winkle, you know, he slept through the American Revolution, 20 years the story goes, right? We got a good 40 years on him, we got the prize, we can take the prize home, but we can wake up. No. So the question is the content. There is no fight for Glass-Steagall, there is no fight for Nawapa, there is no health system, they're cutting down health. All right, Bob Matter. <clears throat> Would you agree or disagree that the Constitution is not a suicide pact? Uh, absolutely, it's not a suicide pact. So, what are you saying? Well, you're, you were, uh, you know, uh, criticizing Obama for using drones for killing enemy combatants. That's not in the Constitution. Well. Uh, just because somebody's an American citizen or had been or whatever, once once they cross to the other side and they are now an enemy of ours, they are no longer protected by that constitution which they are seeking to destroy. So we put. Uh, so we're allowed to kill them. No, you can take them to trial. <laughs> you can actually uh, give them their day in court. Uh, you can actually be a human American citizen. But not when they're engaged in an act of war. This is not like writing. Who knows that? that? What's that? You don't know that. He didn't have a trial. What was he doing? You don't know. You didn't care. You have an American citizen blown away by a drone. Did he have a day in court? Somebody said he was a terrorist, working with terrorists. Was he? You don't know. Somebody made an arbitrary decision that this guy's got to go. We're a nation of law. We're not a, a nation of, of a butcher. All right. Ivan Rueda. Yeah, thanks. Uh yeah, one of your premises seem, uh, is, I mean, you mentioned it several times, that the United Kingdom kind of runs the American government, or runs Obama. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I can't agree with that, but I, I want to push that to the side and ask you, because you, well, one of your other premises seems to be that, we, that the American government, as a, as a matter of policy, should be completely pacifist. Uh, there doesn't seem to be, uh, or I want you to articulate, what is the, the rationale do, does the American government have a rationale? Does it have a purpose in defending the American society? Sure. But two things. One, when if I you say... articulated you know, unilateral surrender. I mean... Uh, no, 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 stop. Okay, You're well. getting ahead of yourself. First of all, the United Kingdom is not the empire that we're talking about. The United Kingdom is the kingdom of Scotland, the kingdom of Ireland, the kingdom of, of England, right? So they are under and suppressed by this same oligarchy. Now, what you have is, is think not in terms of the one little island. Think of an international network of financial control, political control, uh, resource control, thought control, education control, right? That you have an empire like the Roman Empire that stays in place by manipulating you know, religions against each other in a, in a pantheon that they allow and then they play against each other, or they, they pit various nationalities against each other, but they maintain a top-down control by controlling the finances and who gets, who gets money. And that's why LaRouche is saying, forget the money system, go back to a credit system where the credit is determined by the government and the people where they want to go. So, on your first point, I'm not talking about the, the uh, <coughs> United Kingdom. We're talking about this um, parasitic operation that sits there with the kind of the titular head of the Queen and Prince Philip, but this network of oligarchy and cartels, really, you know, 
And this is what's pretty much dominated science and whatever, right? And then your second point was um, on the question of, uh, you know, the purpose of the United States. The United States is a government established in its constitution and a directed banking credit system precisely against that kind of oligarchical structure to finance and, and foster the development of the general welfare through patents, through directed credit, through new technologies to actually build not only ourselves as a republic doing that, but foster those kinds of republics around the world. And that's what we've left. We should be actually working with nations around the world, put through here and around the world this Glass-Steagall global reorganization and direct credit into all these projects and the projects themselves will build us out of this financial crash. Right. Well, my question so went to the purpose of uh, what purpose the government has, our government has, in defending our society, not with respect to any financial relationships, but with respect to uh, foreign policy, foreign intrusions by either national groups or these uh, uh, extremist religious groups. These extremist religious groups are created by this empire to do exactly what they've been doing, pulling the United States into permanent wars. We've been in permanent war since we defeated the British run Nazis in, in the World War II, and we've been in permanent war ever since. We, we literally, coming out of the war, Roosevelt dies, what's the first thing Churchill does? He pits through the speech down in Fulton, Missouri, he starts the whole Iron Curtain, and we got <coughs> ally number one Russia in World War II, and ally number two China, they become the Chinese Russian, M and we fight my entire life, we're fighting an anti-communist fight created by the British, ideology. Oh. We left the American system. No, yeah. Uh, you're talking too much about personalities. Like Obama has his personality, it's true, but he's got his backers. And the old 10 of 1% control the United States and most of the world. The British come in on that, but on the secondary position. So why do you uh, talk about personality so much? Hitler was financed by the junkers, the bankers, and the industrialists. Otherwise, he couldn't came to come into power. Right, That's same the problem today. The war. So why are you talking so much about personalities when personalities don't mean that much? Well, because the control of that finance that created Hitler is exactly what's running it today. We didn't uh, dismantle that. We let that come back to uh, power after Roosevelt died. That's the fight I'm talking about. But it's run by this higher level, the, the empire, the British. Joe Yeah, I, I'd like to know what Lenny's smoking to come up with this hodgepodge, mishmash uh, theories of half truths, lies, and conspiracies. Such as what? I mean, for example, like Obama wants thermonuclear war is one example. I mean, he doesn't want thermonuclear war. I mean, he's, well, how could he benefit from that, you know? I mean, did you know this, this like, was did you know this was going on? This actual face-off that's set up? Oh, I mean, yeah, it was going on under, uh, jo you know, George Bush before him. It's just a continuation. Right, so the policy didn't change. It's, it's a continuation of the U.S. foreign policy. He doesn't, you know, it, it's it's just about controlling, like, like, like the half truths. Want to control the world, you know, going to Iraq, Iran, this, that, and another. But they don't want thermal nuclear war, and you're. No, you're you're putting it, it all, like you're saying, like he's saying, you're putting it all on him. I mean, saying, you put a little bit of truth and then all no, no, these no. lies he, together. He happens to be the president who would push the buttons. So the question is... So what the is, next one? Huh? So what the next one? You better change it. That's and the what, next one. That's what the whole discussion's all about. Gotta get rid of capitalism. The question is, can you give up your ideology and change and change the policy? Right, you gotta get rid of capitalism. <laughs> but that's, that's a slogan until you have an actual program. I got a program. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have glass steagall is not a problem. Glass steagall is just a reform. Okay, I mean, All right. Right. You don't understand glass steagall. Scott Redmond. <laughs> I, 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 I have a general question. I'm for that reform. Has, has, has the Living LaRouche Party really so. thought through what what's best for getting the most out of what it has to say? In other words, some things you say make a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to do that water project. It makes a lot of sense to not have these two boxes and have other choices. 
But when you start talking to someone such as myself, who was a pretty much a lifelong Republican until I decided to vote with my heart and head as opposed to my pocketbook, um, and then I, then I changed to Democrat recently, but when you're talking to someone like me, who's probably your best audience, okay, Mid, you know, late 40s, call me a one percenter if that's what you want to call me, I can support a candidate. And, and you make some sense on a lot of things, and then you throw in such bullshit, such weird shit. I mean, <laughs> well, when you, what, my point is, when you talk about a narcissist, the question is, can LaRouche and those key party people in that party control themselves to the point to stick on the real... I, I know you guys believe what you say, and it may, may be true. It's very scary if it's true, and I, and, and I appreciate you for pointing a lot of that stuff out. That's why people want to get off the subject. But, but you lose... The more important support when you're talking about these jobs things, and when you're talking about Lady Glass Eagle, when you go off and talk about asteroids, and you go off and talk about the British Empire, and so as a as a as a person who could agree, because I think like we're locked here in Chicago into what we have in terms of in terms of local government, isn't he the narcissist who just can't control himself? to say, okay, this is the real important stuff, and I may believe all this stuff, and it may be true, and it's important for people to talk about, but you lose your message when you go off in this direction and all this stuff. Well, maybe not. Maybe maybe it's the problem is that people haven't thought about the right subjects. The narcissist. Like on the, on the question of the economic crash, most people still think they got a way to get through, and what are they going to do when the entire financial system just disintegrates? And that, and you think you get a problem? great subject, but then we talk about asteroids. Yeah, but how do you we fix it? You have the, to fight the, the enemy. You have to fight who's doing it. Why isn't it in the news? There's one big question. Why isn't it in the debate? So you have a bigger enemy than you think, but you haven't chosen to look. Why is it in the news? Charles? <laughs> yeah, well, Ron, yes. we got one candidate who's got an elevator in his garage, <laughs> and he tore a house mansion down to build another mansion, and he's a Wall Street type guy, and he's for the one percenters and all this to listen to him. And then you come along and you tell me that Obama's under the control of the economic oligarchy? It, it would appear that he's probably not the guy. It's the other guy. Well, I didn't get to it when the question was asked. Obama doesn't, to me, doesn't look like... But the Austrian school is run by that same empire. The oligarchy that's running things. Which candidate? And I had to say, it's got to be this Romney guy. Charlie, we should have stopped you when you turned the ball game back on. It's got nothing to do with the candidates. It has to do with... Or are we going to change the policy? We have to stop the war. Well, we're going to direct I had credit. a choice in November because I had a vote. Paper and plastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, I agree, there's an oligarchy. But it literally looks like one guy is controls and the other guy ain't. Well, they're actually both controlled. That's why you have the mess you've got. Now, the question is. What else do you have that Obama's on it? He's a, it seems like a populist kind of thing and for the poor, poor and needy and all that. That's for the poor and needy. He has the poor and needy. control of the, the rich, right? Take, name me one poor and needy that's uh, accepted that they still have a certain amount of hope there. There's, I mean, that delusion's long gone, you know. The problem is, is both candidates, the structure of the candidates, the media of the candidacy, has all been one big diversion. The real issue is the financial crash, what are we going to do to fix it, like Lincoln and Roosevelt and the Founding Fathers laid out, and two, are we going to stop this war to get, be in a position to do that? And then we can actually do a lot of different things that have to be done. But if you don't stop that, you're going to be dead before you get around to the subject. Would you support Big Bird and Oscar oh, the Grouch as candidates? Wait, wait, wait one follow up. Look, Romney wants to I, call some. Bob Matter has a question. And give it to Wall Street. You tell me he's. No, uh, Charlie, you've control. had your question. Uh, Bob Matter? Yeah, I wonder if you uh, knew, what, knew what the law of rent was, and if so, if you would explain it to us. The law of rent. Law of rent, yeah. Like, you know, oh, my God. Rent on the back law of rent. I'm a landlord. I have to know this. Why don't we talk about that in private? Because it's, 
We really have a subject here. See, this is what this is the key thing with the American people. There is a danger, and we used to rally ourselves like we did in the Cuban Missile Crisis, as much as we knew about it. We at least rallied ourselves to be scared, to start doing something, to figure out what Kennedy's doing here. Are we getting through this? It was at least the subject. This is all going on now is not even a subject. They got us so entertained. We got six different versions of Viagra. Yeah, we can debate forever <laughs> which is the best and which is not. We are, have become a silly people. And that's the dumbing down problem. And if you want to really see the consequences of that, my generation, the baby boomers, are bad enough. But look at the younger people who aren't even being given a chance. Now, one thing you have with this NAWAPA plan and some of these scientific drivers is let's take a lot of these young people, take the skilled workforce we still have, another five to seven years, if we have those years, we won't have them, start these projects. There's 369 projects. Get them going. They're already you know, completely worked out. Get some uh, CCC programs. Working for a while, you know, half the day, going to school the other day. Get them, train them in engineering, train them in a, in a health program. Give them a sense of life. Right now you got a culture that says go kill whatever you, 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 you feel bad about. But we created that culture. We haven't done anything since we got pulled into that Vietnam War for no reason except that Jack Kennedy was against it and they shot Jack Kennedy and took us there anyway and not one person in the country had the guts to stand up or at least create a movement that said we're not going to tolerate this. We're not going to tolerate the, the Kennedy cover-ups, the King cover-up. We're not going to tolerate now that there's 28 pages sitting there from 9-11 that document this higher level that ran it. How can anybody leave this room and let that intact? Knowing what you know about Glass-Steagall, we can bankrupt this whole bunch that people say is all powerful, bankrupt them and go back to directed credit. Let's actually pick this nation up by picking ourselves up. That's what this election's all about. We gotta say no more ball games, no more orchestrated Fed candidates that I gotta pick one or the other, and that's it, and then we'll take the consequences. Consequences are way out of anything you're thinking about. Now we got one fight for the war situation. We got to take this guy off the button. He likes the killing. You can tell it in the drone program. And secondly, we'll deal with whatever. If we change him right now, we can change it. Maybe we could do something besides Romney. But it looks like he would get it. But well, you can't have the policies, austerity policies, running anything. You got to change the austerity policy. That's the subject. So we got to actually get ourselves waked up. And you can use Larusha's site to do that. That's why it's there. All right, Butler and then uh, Peter. Yeah, you've at least five times uh, been highly critical of the uh, drone program. Would you rather, if we had decided to hit those targets, would you rather ha they had been manned aircraft, and would you rather have seen the pilots of those planes, after they've been shot down, brought back in a flag-draped coffin, or would you rather have us simply use the drones to do what we were going to do in any case, which was to go after legitimate targets, the war dangerous is targets? Legitimate. Going after bandits is the war. Target. They're not the bandits. We created them. Our intelligence layers tied to the British created them. It's an orchestrated fight. You know, if I walk over to somebody like this, and I stand here next to him, and I come around, and I flick his ear, and there's somebody over there, well, he might go beat him up. You know, they're, they're creating wars, and, and what you have is we go pole vaulting into every place because we got to deal with them. And now we're finding out that the people we went to Afghanistan to defeat, the Al-Qaeda, well, that's what Obama and, and the, these networks and the British put in in Libya. And now they, they've moved to the next level, and we're arming them in Syria. We're actually funding both sides. So talk about a sucker operation. You're in a fight that you don't understand, and you've picked a side, like the ball game, like the, like the elections. But the whole thing has nothing to do with anything. If we went to an American policy, we'd direct credit into those areas with those nations and develop the whole area and undercut those situations like we used to when we had an American policy. All right, Peter. That's, uh, <coughs> nuclear war. Where is the red line with the Russians fighting? For Syria or is it Iran or where is the red line be drawn? 
Well, the Russians have drawn the red line on the um, sovereignty. What you have on the American and the Israeli side, they've drawn the line on uh, a claim, for example, in Iran, that they, they're now moving on the nuclear weapons. We see everybody out there knows Iran hasn't got nuclear weapons. You know, the same way they were weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq. So, I mean, at a certain point, you know, we have to actually look at what's wrong with the way we think. You know, if you own the bar and three nights that week, you know, two guys started a fight and your cash register was empty, right? You can say, well, on night number one, I got fooled. Night number two, I was busy and they pulled it on me again. But you know, night number three, when you didn't see the guy come in from a different, and sit at the corner of the bar, that when the fight started, they robbed you blind, well then you gotta say, something else is a little dumb here. And the, and the problem we have with the American people is we've been acting as dumb as dirt on some of these bigger questions, and we still like to find ways to justify that it's right, and there's no case for it anymore. Like the Libyan situation, and the taking down of the uh, Benghazi consulate. There is no excuse. It was done, it was a lie, they covered up the lie, they got caught covering up the lie, and they're getting caught covering up the cover-up, and impeachment is now in the works. Now the question is, are we gonna come out of the other side of this a little smarter and with a nation? So it can't be Romney's economic policy or Romney's ideology. It has to be American citizens saying, boy, did we goof up. We have a generation that we have to patch up and pick up and build out of this. Now, there's any number of things people can do in terms of getting on Lynn's material regularly from the subscriptions to the website. But these are subjects we've gone through here, and many of you a couple of times, and you can't play dumb that it wasn't Last Eagle, the WAPA plan, and everything that's been laid out for months, and in LaRouche's case, is years. The one thing you do know and can hang on to, no matter what political persuasion and ideology you are, is that Lyndon LaRouche has been right, has been had the guts to say it, and now has the program in front of you to pull all those ideologies together as they give up the ideology, and let's solve the problem. Can you give us your websites a Just little bit? Just a moment. Uh, uh, yeah, do you think the changes that you are suggesting, uh, do you think there's any realistic possibility they will come to pass with our current uh, democratic institutions and structures, or do you think it's going to take a bloody revolution? Well, I think that's why you should listen to Lynn. Both his birthday address, which is on the site, which was just asked for, LaRouchePack.com, his 90th birthday discussion was specifically on this question of parties and how the parties are used to manipulate and keep people out of the real mission and purpose of the nation. And um, whether we can change it in time, it's, it's really a matter of not thinking in terms of how do we change the party structure. It's overwhelm the party structure with individuals who take up the, the actual serious nature we're in. And see, if individuals, even though they don't think they have a role to play, if we start doing that, putting every congressman's home here in their district, put them on the spot on this. Why isn't Glass-Steagall passed? Why, is, uh, why are we being lied to on this? Why is there no discussion of the... Uh, I mean, there's another situation. You take, take the dairy situation in the country. The food bill just ran out at the end of September. Food stamps and some insurance situations are covered and carried automatically from different approaches, but like for the dairy supports, they're over. So you take a place like California, where 20% of the, the milk of the United States is produced, since the corn crop is what it is, and the price of corn, and they were still putting 50% into uh, ethanol, the food costs and everything going through the ceiling, we could lose 25 to 30% of the dairies in California in the next two to three months. It's probably the same in Wisconsin and everything else. Now here's the food of the United States. Have we done anything in an emergency form with the droughts and the flooding and the fires and everything this, this, uh, this year to shore up a crop? No, no emergency. 
There's been no Roosevelt-Lincoln policy. And you can't say, well, it's all control, Obama couldn't do anything, the Republicans do, couldn't do anything. The fact that it is not a subject is the problem, and it's not a subject in the American people as well. So we're letting our food, everything else being taken down, and it's not a subject because we've been lulled to sleep, and we get into picking our candidate and going to the ball game. Well, you, you seem to be saying that you think we can make these changes through democratic institutions. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, you know, Maybe obviously what my opinion is, my opinion is we can't, that it's going to take uh, a revolution, a major revolution to make get the changes we need. Well, it's going to be, Either it's going to changes to... or other people's ideas on changes, it's not going to happen. Well, it's going to take a revolution, but look at the situation in Greece, look at the situation in any one of these nations where there are revolutions going on. Nobody is going to solve anything unless you put through a Glass-Steagall, set the bogus debt to the side, and get those nations credit to put their populations to work building out of it. So you actually have a basis to have a peace. And it's the same in the United States. So we're going to have a revolution back to the American system of credit. And whether that goes to, to violence by other people running manipulations to keep that from happening, whether they know it or not, the empire would actually create those kinds of situations like they're doing in every one of those situations. Create the crisis to get the lockdown. That's fascism. They're running both sides. So if we don't fall for the two-sided thing, whether you're talking about the election or whether you're talking about policy, and we start thinking in terms of what the nation has to do. How do we triple food production? What do you have to build? How do you get um, the power system? Just start putting together a bill of goods of what we need as a nation and a world 25, 50 years down the world, down the road, and get the credit system as the Constitution says to start building. We'll solve our problems. You can do that with one piece of emergency legislation. Starts with Glass-Steagall, credit system, and you're on your way. Like Roosevelt did it. We have a history of doing this. Is that in the debate? Is that in the election? But we don't demand it. So we are getting in our congressman's face, force him back down to D.C. What are you doing home campaigning for, you know, another hand, you know, your own handout? Get back down and do something real. Pass Glass-Steagall and pass this. Stop this war. But I, I don't see that happening. Well, you have to make it happen. Okay. It's what we do full, full time. That's why LaRouche is so controversial. That's why they got to isolate him and say, don't think about this. That's crazy. That's crazy. You're going to look a little different. Uh, I've got, got a question myself, and that is, I, you know, I've been aware of uh, Mr. LaRouche for some time, uh, back to when he was Lynn Marcus. Uh, I, I remember uh, him uh, talking about people eating out of garbage uh, pails uh, back in... Uh, in 71 uh, at, uh, at Columbia University. Uh, uh, I, I, and it was going to be in the next few weeks. Uh, well, it didn't happen right then, although we've had various economic problems. Uh, uh, it may happen. I expect that our glorious capitalist economics society will have its contradictions and uh, the, the fall of the rate of uh, profit uh, will stimulate these contradictions to the point where uh, workers will take over sometime. But, uh, but uh, He's been wrong on so many things, whether it was cold fusion or uh, uh, the Queen of England uh, or uh, uh, I just, you know. Okay, why don't, why don't you stop there because no, it's the same thing you said each time I've been here and um, obviously you haven't changed your ideology because you're back to the same kind of um, fluctuations that are going to cause some kind of magical rise to a solution. That itself is an ideology. We're either going to produce something real and build our way out of this, 
dealing with that financial crash. And if you go point by point through everything that Lynn's laid out in terms of the British tie to this as an extension of the old Roman Empire, the entire policy that the world is now discussing in terms of the land bridge, the nuclear power, you name it, it's all out there. It's just that people stay within their ideological little notions. So I come in here and, it, and you, you bring back up what LaRouche was saying in the 70s, and you, it's used as a bypass of what's actually going on now when it was just as precise then as it is now. So we have ways to protect ourselves. We're already off the subject that as we're speaking here in this room, there are meetings going on with the Joint Chiefs of Staff directly collaborating and corresponding with the Russian military layers on this question of thermonuclear war coming out of the Libyan situation, uh, well, the build out of that, but they're now going into Mali and Libya in this fake chase down of who did it. Syrian situation, the toppling of it. Turkey's at war, it's NATO. We were arming literally the entire situation around China and the South Pacific. All that is going on. We spent two hours discussing it, and the economic policy to bankrupt that bunch and build out of it, and we changed the subject. That's why people hang on to their notion that LaRouche wasn't right, because they've got to change the subject. Like the British need back down nations so they can stay in, in charge. What I'm trying to point out is that some people have little ideological notions and some people have very big ideological notions, but sometimes they're not altogether real, uh, though they're, they may relate to reality and uh, a lot of realities that uh, are... Well, you're now in, one, in a situation where wrong okay. opinions can get you killed. Okay, right. Uh, now, do we have a couple more questions? Oh, I Ivan and, and then uh, Charles. Well, yeah, the one thing that pops out in your discussion to me is um, uh, your criticism of uh, maybe the international financial relationships that go on, that is our present status quo. So I'm thinking maybe uh, instead of these nuclear wars that you're forecasting, couldn't it be like an international worldwide huge bankruptcy where maybe all the entire system says, we're not paying our debt, let's start new, and, and then we begin this American uh, credit that you nostalgically recall? No, actually, you're in that crash already, and the networks that are running the war are running it because they don't want to lose control. Because if we put through Glass-Steagall and nations build out of this, they will no longer be an oligarchy. They will be finished. We will complete the American Revolution. We'll have other nations joining that real revolution. Not a violent resolution. <coughs> so you have to build a content where you're actually building the physical economy. That's the subject. And there's nothing mentioned in this election on the physical economy. That's the trick. And people fall for it. All right. Uh, Charles? Yeah, no, Ron. The other day they were criticizing Obama because he hadn't done anything about Iran. Now you come along and you're saying he's going to drop a nuclear bomb on them. Now, there's this distinction here, which he's not done anything, but you say suddenly, abruptly, he's going to drop a nuclear bomb, use nuclear weapons. No, what you have is a situation... On, on a situation he's kind of like disregarded? No. You're taking the, the media and the British one well, line that there's a problem with the, a, There is no nuclear program in Iran except Republicans to, were the ones who were accused. Yeah, that, what I'm saying is... They're saying, did you guys want a war? Charles, you just brought up the ball game again. It's got nothing to do with Democrat and Republican. It has to do with putting a line out that... Iran is creating a nuclear weapon when they're not, they don't have a delivery system. Why is that taking place? They should have a right to a nuclear energy program, which most of the world is willing to give them. So what's the subject? The subject is use a crazy like a Netanyahu, who is a British agent, and an Obama to draw the line that we need an invasion. And people laugh because they don't understand a clue what is actually running their world. All right. Uh, yes, Kathy. 
Thank you. Happy read. Okay. Yeah, I understand a lot of what you're saying because the Fast Table Act was really uh, Clinton put the kibosh on it. And since then, it, it's been downhill ever since. As a result, this is what we have today. And, even, and I saw the debate. It, it was a debacle. Yeah. That's what it really now, what you bring up there with Clinton is true, and he, at times, admits that that was the dumbest thing he ever did. He did a lot of things. Right. Now, what he said about the same time, just prior to that, when Russia was, Soviet Union was crashing, he said, maybe we need a new financial structure. So like a Ronald Reagan who adopted LaRouche's policy for the defense of laser, Ronald Reagan, another president, is now saying, maybe we need to reorganize this financial system more back, he didn't say a Roosevelt policy, but he was reading LaRouche. So at that point, you know, look at a, we talked about this last time I was here. At that point, uh, Monica Lewinsky shows up in the basement, <laughs> right? Now, how does a Monica Lewinsky, who's a known operative all her life, <laughs> Monica, Monica Lewinsky, who since, since she was a kid, was Monica Lewinsky, since she was a kid, you know, teenager, young girl, had a just a lot of fun, and maybe made some money seducing older guys. Now, how does a person with that known, how does that known, how does that known track record kind of individual get into a White House basement in a position to profile him? I'm not saying Bill did the have for it, he did. So, so it's a setup, like any other sex scandal, to deal with him because he's now breaking out of the box. And see, when he was tied up with all that, Al Gore and some of these guys were running more of these British operations, and they ran through this Plastigal operation. He did sign off on it, and it's stupid, and he knows it's stupid. Now, why is he still stupid today? Well, look at the thug operation that went on on his wife in the last election, with a lot of these Soros operations, even some you know deaths along the way, and you have a situation where she even backed down before it got to the convention. So Obama really never got an, you know, an honest vote even out of the Democratic Convention. It's always been this thuggery, even the first time. Oh. So the question is, is all this is coming public? People can say, oh, 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 but it's all coming public. That's the difference is now happening. So the question is, Bill Clinton endorsed Obama at the convention. Why? Well, because of this thuggery. And LaRouche is calling him out, basically saying exactly that. People shouldn't listen to him and his scared kind of state, and they should look at these bigger questions. And that's exactly the kind of break from this party silly going along to get along nonsense that's got to take place. Well, even I think though, if we're on a fast track to get trajectory towards economic collapse, you know, how long will it take before none of the money that is print that we print is worth anything like the Civil War? It's just not worth anything. The, the only thing that will fix that is you got to put through Glass-Steagall, which separates the real from the bogus and puts you in a position to direct credit that's tied to these economic projects. Then the, then the project grounds it. Physical economy. Uh, Bernie Kahane. Could you tell me how I could get a Monica Lewinsky in my life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people are pretty, pretty good at that themselves. Let's, okay. let's go to rebuttals, Brom. Yes, I think it is time for rebuttals. All right. All right. All right. Uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take careful notes to correct our discomfort. Uh, all right. I want to know how many people have some wisdom to impart. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. All right. Uh, five minutes, Prom. Five minutes. Okay, and beginning uh, with we got an empty microphone. Let's get up there. Ah. Our speaker indicated that uh, Lyndon LaRoche, me, uh, Lynn Martin, uh, at 90 years of age, spends 90 to 95 hours a week. Uh, working. I have no doubt that that's true. But he's spewing out the same nonsense 
that he was 40 years ago, and he hadn't stopped. Um, for example, the, the, the British agency of all the people in the United States and elsewhere who are conspiring to uh, do whatever Lyndon LaRoche doesn't like. And uh, Lyndon LaRoche for 40 years has been giving uh, two and three hour speeches. Uh, uh, they're very tiring. You know, two or three hours here at uh, the college is great. You know, lots, of, lots of activity here. But it's interesting that we, members of the College of Complexes, are asking questions of Mr. Baca as though he could offer rational, convincing answers. Not unlike last week's situ situation with uh, <laughs> global warming. <laughs> Uh, LaRoutism, if you want to call it that, is actually uh, right-wing populism. That's all it really is. Uh, we have a structural problem in the capitalist world. What is it? You have a saturated economy where goods are just being saturated and they can't get rid of it because people don't have enough money to buy back what they produce. So you have a worldwide depression. And you got a situation in Europe that is more or less tending towards revolution. And there's no way that the United States is going to get out of it. The thermonuclear war will just destroy the world. That's all it's going to do. And the uh, powers that be, in other words, the 0.10% of 1% uh, will just lose everything they have and they won't be able to get any work. So, uh, so what, 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 what we're having is a bigger and bigger bubble. And the bubble is uh, to the point where it could cause revolution all over the world that'll make 1929 look like a tea party. And that's what you have. And the only way to solve this is for people to take the production in their own hands and not allow a, a small percentage of the population to control everything. And if they, st if they start a war in the Middle East like they're tending, I think he's correct on that, What's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of people revolting. Like right, right now, for instance, in, uh, in Pakistan and in uh, these other countries, you have people that are so fed up with these wars that they're going to have revolutions there. And in Greece and Spain, you got 50% unemployment in Spain. And in Greece, it's the same or even worse. And the uh, left is organizing there, and the right is also organizing. And what you're going to have there is a revolution, eventually. So the whole the whole uh, economy uh, can't can't actually keep going like it is. It's structured in a way that it that is, it's all saturated and it can't keep going. There's no way that the capitalists are going to actually going to solve their problems. There's no way they're going to do it. And if they start a war, they'll just destroy themselves. It's the economy, stupid. That's the most important thing in this election. And, uh, you know, the thing is, it's labor. we got to get with uh, labor. But I want to address uh, the Lyndon uh, LaRouche pack. It's basically the anti-union racist fascist organization that puts on uh, democratic uh, sheep's clothing basically but on that tip I'm uh, I'm all for uh, Glass-Steagall we need to put Glass-Steagall in that's a good reform you know to separate the commercial and investment banking because we had this housing bubble that they sent out these mortgages loans to people they know they couldn't pay it and then they, they sold it as an investment and they they didn't care because they got, they got paid for it, and they took bets on it that it was going to fail. So, I mean, it was all a setup. But 
Now, that's part one of my 10-point program, okay? Now, June 23rd, 1947, a day that I'll live in the infamy. It was the day uh, they passed uh, Taft-Hartley over Truman's veto. That's part two. What we need to do is repeal Taft-Hartley, if everybody's familiar with that. It, it creates all the tactics that unions could use to win in victories, and all the things that work, you know, secondary boycotts and, you know, all different, you know, kinds of solidarity strikes and all that kind of good stuff. You know, Taft hardly made that illegal, which one fair labor practices just was what was put on businesses. Okay? You know, and, um, okay, number three is the um, Employee Free Choice Act. We need to pass a law that will make it easier for unions to organize with card check recognition. 51% of the people signing cards are members. I mean, any other organization, if you sign a card, you're a member. Why do you even have to have a vote to give a time to the, the company run an anti-union campaign to scare people? Four, universal single-payer health care. So unions don't have to uh, be held hostage by employers for their health care. And then, then it also wouldn't allow corporations who are doing the right thing and providing health care be even, you know, on even footing with companies who aren't providing health care for people. Right. Okay, and how about end the wars and bring the troops home? Instead of spending money making bombs and tanks and planes, we could use that to build our infrastructure. It's almost going to sound like some Lenin and Lurch stuff. We could have a work program and put, you know, millions of people to work rebuilding the infrastructure of this country. Roads, uh, streets, schools. High but, um, speed trains. High speed trains. I know Charlie would chime in, but no, nah, no nuclear power, none of that crap. We need green energy. You know, man, Jimmy Carter had solar panels on the uh, rooftop and Reagan came in there and took them down. We had solar panels yeah. everywhere, windmills everywhere, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We could put people to work. You know, everybody have, the, you know, some, uh, somebody in the neighborhood watching all the kids. How many neighborhoods there are? And then somebody else cutting the grass. I mean, there would be millions of jobs right there. Okay, after all, um, we need to rebuild America. I already went through that. Number seven, nationalism. We need to end the privatization of public services. Anytime you privatize something, the cost of it goes up and the quality of service goes down. Why? Because it has to all go to pay CEOs and stockholders. Okay, eight, you need to nationalize everything. You got to nationalize everything that's of important to the people of this country, whether all the schools need to be nationalized and they're trying to do, turn to public services. What happened in the city of Chicago when we had a little fire? Well, we had a, a private uh, private fire companies that they fight over the, who's going to put out the fire with axes, and the whole town burnt down. That's what happened. So we, so we need everything nationalized, whether it's GM needs to be nationalized, you know, all, all the important things, the energy sectors, so on and so forth. Okay, and another thing is, number nine in the program, work camps. Put all supervisors and management in work camps. One year, hard labor for all supervisors. Two years, hard labor, labor for all management. Okay? And then if they, if they want to go have a fight about that, well then we just put them in there permanently, 24-7, no food, no water, and work until they die. <laughs> <laughs> I chose to respond to the uh, question that Charlie put in there, what's really at stake in this coming election? Uh, and what is at stake is how can we support the common good, common will? Uh, I've got three references, Why America Failed by Morris Berman. If you get that book, you can read the first uh, introductory chapter, it's about eight pages and figure out what, roughly what the whole book is about. The article I put on the front uh, by Clarence Page, uh, I am soft on Clarence Page, I understand he used to be a second Unitarian member. I, I, I don't know, I have no proof of this, but I've heard this word of mouth. And then the third uh, reference is something I put in the Jane Adams Senior Caucus uh, when we had a the program for our last uh, luncheon. Uh, Morris Berman's uh, book, pretty much, he pretty much says that we Americans are a bunch of hustlers. Uh, we're uh, dedicated to uh, eternal progress and our religion seems to be the, uh, 
technology and we're interested in corporate capitalism and protecting that. Um, his values are family, community, craft, balance, and the common good. I'm fairly close to some of his ideas. Uh, Clarence Page, in his article on the coming election, said that their choice is between an Eisenhower Republican, that's the president, and kind of reactionary uh, conservatives. Uh, I will say that when you take a look at, uh, at uh, Mitt Romney, he probably has private morality. I mean, I don't think he would sell his kids into uh, slavery or cheat on his wife or steal money from his church. Beyond that, he has no morality. That, the, in the public sphere, he wants to win and he'll do basically anything uh, that he can get away with to win. I think that's his, his uh, goal there. You don't care about dogs. What's that? You don't care about dogs. His family dog. Yeah. <laughs> or birds for that matter. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the slogans I've got are, if I can read them, uh, all for one and one for all, room for all, no one left behind, unite and win. The people united will never be divided. Uh, if we go for those things, I think we would kind of have something. Uh, and that's kind of uh, my goal and what's at stake in the election is that we have to unite and we have to work together for the common good. I don't think we're going to do that, but I believe in uh, <coughs> hope over reality, and therefore that's what I'm going to work on. I'm Michael Foley. As far as what Gene said about Romney will do anything to get elected, Romney's head advisor already told us that. I agree with you, Gene. Remember, there was some guy a few months ago who said, Oh, Romney, he'll just say anything he has to to get the nomination, and after that, he'll tell the people anything he has to do to get elected. That guy was supposedly Romney's top personal friend and advisor for 25 years or something like that. Anyway, I also took note of the note that was in the schedule about how everybody gets five minutes to discuss the important issues of the coming election. That's what I was going to talk about, too. I don't think there are any issues in this election. I think our nation is on a course that is set. It's not a good course. We're, I'm the guy that says we're not going to hell on a fast train. We're already there. But I do acknowledge we're not really there yet, but we really are going there. There are certain facts of life in this country, and I don't think it matters who gets elected, either president or in the Congress, or any local election, state or city, or anywhere around the country. If Obama is re-elected, if Mitt Romney is elected, or if, like I said, I've said before, I think somehow Rahm Emanuel is going to finickle, finickle a way to sneak himself in and be sworn in as president in January, it's not going to matter what happens in this country. We are on our way to enormous inflation that will impoverish all. There are certain facts of life in this country, and I think the, the one main priority, one primary fact of life in this country is everything is going up except your income. I think that's the way it is in this country, and I think that's the way it's going to be for as far as you can see. There's certain simple things. The guy that was up here from the LaRouche said uh, all these politicians are running for office to talk about cutting the budget, cutting the budget, cutting the budget. That's not true. If President Obama is re-elected, the federal budget will increase. And if Mitt Romney is elected, the federal budget will increase, and they have both said so 
one way or another. What they're arguing about is how much to increase it. One guy says instead of increasing it by a trillion, we'll increase it only by 900 million, and that's a cut. That's BS. It's an increase. Our government spends approximately $4 trillion a year. A little over $2 trillion comes from taxes, and a little less than $2 trillion comes from borrowing and printing money, and that is going to continue. Our government is going to continue borrowing and printing money approximately one and a half trillion dollars a year, give or take, forever. Now, this we are now in a period of moderate inflation. Prices of everything, gas, housing, food, clothes, everything keeps going up and up. Wages stay stable at best. And if anything in that situation changes, I feel that prices will continue to rise only faster than what they're rising now. There's another thing. The last few weeks or last month, they've been hearing all this stuff about in the media about how 47% of the people in this country don't pay income tax. And supposedly the implication, I've been hearing this on radio talk shows for a couple of years now. Sean Hannity himself has been crying and moaning about this for at least a year. And his implication is always that somehow this 47% of the people are somehow leeches. He doesn't mention that included in that 40% of the people is people in high school and college on part-time jobs, old people who are on retirement incomes, they don't make enough to pay income tax, on and on. But nobody ever mentions it included in the 47% that never pay income tax in this country. Last year or the year before, General Electric Company made $5 billion in profit. Not their total income, but profit. And they paid zero income tax, and it was all legal and lawful. They weren't cheating. Also, it's been mentioned only once in a while, General Motors doesn't have to pay income tax. For 10 years at least, that was part of the bailout deal. They got a $185 million welfare check, no, excuse me, $185 billion welfare check, Fine. and they don't have to pay income tax. Okay. And the implication in that was also all the other country companies, including the 10 biggest banks in this country that took the welfare money on the bailout, they don't have to pay income tax for 10 years either. Really? So I, I heard it specifically about General Motors, and the guy who was talking about it implied that everybody else in the bailout also got this 10-year tax grace. I can't say for certain that it's correct, but that was reported on a mainstream radio show. Okay, anyway, that's all. With all due respect to my colleague here, I thought advice and consent was a novel. It wasn't a real thing. Murder charges coming from White House, it falls that low. Next week, uh, two weeks from now, I'll be speaking on behalf of Romney. And uh, I'm supporting him. But now, issue, issues we are facing is our future. People having a jobs, people having a confidence in a future, in ourselves. Four years back, someone talked about red and white, north and south. Unfortunately, I did not believe that. What he said, he believed it, and he did not deliver it. House is as good as the head of the house. Children are going to grow well or be happy as good as the head of the household. If mother and fathers are not caring, then children are not going to be cared for. 
no business can run successfully if a at a head of the table businessman is not talented well educated and has a capacity no government can deliver unless head of the government is capable has a passion has understanding of the issues understanding of the people and cares for the people we have had a great president i greatly admire bill clinton his passion his knowledge of issues his willingness to engage people all adversaries and supporters i admire lyndon b johnson his willingness to and passion to promote his issues and make it happen and so do i support federal fdr his passion his commitment nixon i admire for his knowledge and some great thing he did even though he had a personal failures and clinton had a personal failures and john f kennedy had a personal failures john f kennedy i support because he had a put a he surrounded himself with the people with a great ideas great vision great program and he had the ability and willingness to support lofty goals and programs that can open people's minds and hearts but when you do not see that in our leader it pains you cannot you cannot support somebody on a emptiness you can live with a poor character as we have lived with so many presidents with a poor character and so many who did not become a good president uh, do not become a president at all like a al gore and edward but you cannot live with a president who will not engage who cannot live with a president who doesn't have a passion who cannot live with a president who will not get involved and and those are the issues are the those are the issues it is not about somebody's personal morality or general morality morality has nothing to do say ability to deliver ability to make things happen if you are a president of the company you cannot make a sales no matter how good your morality how much you love your employees they are going to be unemployed you going to have to close the company if you cannot make a sale you cannot survive period thank you All right. Well, um, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, well, like tonight we heard from a speaker who's speaking on behalf of Linda Larouche, and uh, Sid, uh, you uh, re referred to Linda Larouche's philosophy as right-wing populism. And I, I, I think that's not exactly an accurate description of, of Larouche. Uh, see what. A lot of people don't realize is that LaRouche actually started out in politics as a Marxist. Um, he was a he was a Trotskyist to be sure. Uh, but um, at a certain point, he he kind of got away from the Trotskyists and started his own movement. Somebody asked him, I mean, what, what, you know, back in the '60s when he was when he, uh, at the beginning of all this, what, what, how he would classify himself. Well, the Trotskyists sometimes refer to themselves as fourth internationalists. So LaRouche said, well, I'm, I I think I'm going to be a fifth internationalist. So uh, one of the things that he did was he dropped his use of Marxist jargon and, and, and rhetoric and, and symbolism, um, but uh, a lot of the, a lot of his ideas are still essentially Marxist. Now, um, which is not to say that all of the ideas are bad. Restoring Glass Steagall is something I agree with, but I think Larouche comes up with good ideas in the way that a, a clock that has stopped is is still right twice a day. Now, um, now to, to get to 
uh, one of the issues that I would have with our speaker is that he never did actually answer the question that I asked about who he would support for president. It doesn't have to be Romney or Obama because there's a bunch of other candidates. There's Jill Stein of the Green Party, who's, um, and, and, and there's, I think the Libertarians are running somebody, and so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be Romney or Obama. Now, uh, but he didn't, and I don't know if Lyndon LaRouche is running this year or not. Uh, the speaker didn't say, but um, so it would be nice to it would be nice to actually get a straight answer to a question. But I think our speaker would make a good politician since uh, he did not uh, answer the question straight. Uh, now, uh, calling austerity Nazi stuff is actually it's totally the opposite because the Nazis actually when when the Nazis were in power in Germany they actually put more money into social and economic programs um, and, and and then comparing it to the Austrian school of economics is, is crazy because because the, the, the Austrian school of economics and the Nazism were almost diametrically opposed to each other with, with the Austrian school advocating the government uh, completely hands off the economy and the Nazis wanted total government control over the economy. Now, okay, now the, the two groups had nothing to do with each other. Now, uh, the United States did not overthrow Gaddafi, the people of Libya did. There was some assistance from the U.S., but uh, that, but it was actually the Libyans who overthrew it, and it was Libyan rebels who started the revolt against Gaddafi. And uh, now, uh, you know, Charlie talked about, uh, you know, the real issues here, and I, I'd like to, our speaker had a lot of things to say about Obama. He seemed much more critical of Obama than of Romney, but I'd just like to let everybody know here that about you know, what I consider some of the important issues. And I think, you know, there's a tendency, especially among people on the left, to say, ah, Republicans, Democrats, not a dime's worth of difference between them, you know. And um, now, I think anyone who, I, I would like to invite all, I think there is a difference between these two parties. Yes, they agree on certain things, largely, such as foreign policy, but on, on domestic issues and, and socioeconomic policies, they are very different. Now, and anybody who doesn't think so, I want to, all of you to imagine how things would have turned out if Gore had become president in 2001 instead of George Bush. Now, second, I'd like to get to the whole, let's think about what Mitt Romney wants to do, okay? And these are things, I'm going to mention some things that Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan want to do that Barack Obama is not going to do, or uh, does not want to do. The, first of all, Romney wants to privatize Medicare, okay? That means that instead of you getting uh, those of you who get Medicare, instead of you getting Medicare like, like a government-sponsored insurance program, what you will get is a check from the government, money. And then you can take that money and you can use it to, uh, to buy your own medical insurance from any private company that's willing to sell it to you. Okay? Doesn't that sound like a great deal? Okay. Now, Social Security. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to, he wants to phase out Social Security and replace it with 401k. So instead of your money going into the, the, the Social Security Fund, it will actually go into stock options, okay? And so it, I would like any, uh, so, so hopefully, if, you're, if, if your money is in stock, it, it, it won't turn out as badly as it did in the crash of 2008. <laughs> but you never know. All right, and that's all I have to say on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's been an interesting, I might add, surreal evening. <laughs> um, but I'd like you all to accompany me on a little trip to a mystical land some of us apparently visit only rarely. <laughs> the land of reality. Now, in November, first Tuesday of November, we are not going to be given the options that our speaker tonight was talking about. We are going to have a choice between several candidates, two major ones, Obama and Romney, and a number of second stringers that we may also choose if we desire. The fact of the matter is, none of them are going to bring around a perfect world. But they're the choice that we have on the first Tuesday in November. We take it from there. We make of it what we will and take it as a beginning. Now, I don't know whether we're speaking in 2012 or 1912. This, this, this much vaunted British Empire that we hear about. I didn't realize that in some mythical land it still exists. India is no longer part of the British Empire. 
Canada is no longer a dominion. South Africa is an independent country. Rhodesia is now Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Need I go on? Even Hong Kong is no longer part of uh, the British Empire. They still have Ireland. Uh, we'll discuss that later. They have, they have six counties in Ireland, and there are steps uh, you know, in place to eventually give that area self-government and perhaps inclusion in the republic so that the six counties can return home. But that's, a, that's for a different evening. Uh, that's, a whole, that's a whole discussion in itself. Fact of the matter is, what kind of a British Empire do you have when some of the elite regiments of the British Army have had to merge and in some cases disband because they can no longer afford to keep that kind of a military establishment? Uh, no look, Britain is no longer even the mistress of the seas anymore. Many of their ships are in mothballs. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that they're not an important power I am simply saying that they're hardly in a position to dictate uh, the policies of the world, you know, from some underground bunker in London somewhere, or maybe Sandringham. Uh, as far as the Queen is concerned, since the 1600s, the British monarch has been basically a figurehead. The Queen cannot even write her own speech not because she can't, because she's not allowed to write her own speech when she gives the speech from the throne at the opening of Parliament. What happens is, shortly before she gives that speech, the Prime Minister hands her a copy of the speech that she will give. It lays out policy. Any English subject can discuss politics freely. The Queen can't. The Prince Consort can't. Prince Charles certainly can't. The fact of the matter is, they do not have this kind of power which was taken from them in the 1600s. And as a matter of fact, at least one king really lost his head, quite literally, you know, over how much power a king was supposed to have. So, you know, if you're laying awake at night, worrying about the power of the British Empire and how the president is a British agent and Netanyahu is a British agent and God knows how many British agents there are. <laughs> this gentleman here is wearing a red sweater. Oh, he's a red oh, Wisconsin Badgers. I can tell you, he's a Wisconsin Badgers. I can tell you, I myself am not, nor have I ever been, a British agent. <laughs> the last time I wore a red coat was in grade school when I played Lord Cornwallis in a student play. <laughs> and I got news for you, it hurt me when I had to hand over that sword. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, let's look at the world as it really is. Let's put aside our pipes, let's put aside our bongs, and let's get down to reality and let's begin to change things. Uh, the gentleman here outlined a considerable number of problems. But these problems aren't going to be solved in anywhere except our minds unless we deal with the world as it really is. And folks, I'm here to tell you, the Queen is not going to come and take you in the middle of the night and put you in a prison. She's actually, she's actually a nice lady and that nice German lady, because she's no more English than I am, that nice German lady is not going to lock you up and is not going to take away our freedoms. I think that was settled about 225 years ago. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. The reason I'm wearing red, I'm a Wisconsin Badger fan. And it's tough. It's, oh, likely. it's tough. <laughs> It's tough in an election year when people look and say, oh my God, you're a Republican, God forbid, that's huh? not, not the case. Sussex. Anyway, I was, a, I was at a tenant's rights meeting not too long ago discussing some issues, particularly for low-income tenants, when all of a sudden the group broke out into a chant. We are the 47%. We are the 47 percent, and uh, anyway, that that made everybody feel a little better. Uh, I wanted to uh, expand. I think uh, Mike was talking about this. 
uh, you know, this is a canard. The 47% who pay no income taxes, uh, in fact, pay plenty of taxes, all right? Uh, if anybody works at all, you're going to be paying now, it used to be 15.3%, now it's down to 13.3% with this payroll tax holiday. On every dollar you earn until it goes up over $100,000, uh, they pay sales taxes and they pay various other fees and taxes as well. When you add all of these taxes together uh, with income taxes, they are probably paying as high or higher uh, an effective tax rate uh, a combined complete tax rate than some very wealthy people are. And uh, people don't even think about this. People are starting because of Romney and and uh, uh, what's the millionaire from Omaha? Uh, Warren, Warren, Warren Buffett. Buffett. Warren Buffett because of his talk. Uh, people are starting <coughs> to understand what an effective tax rate is. And that's, in other words, not a tax bracket, but the amount you actually pay in taxes uh, as a percentage of what you earn. This is a very important thing to understand. And people are just now starting to understand that. Pretty soon, hopefully, they'll understand that they should be looking at all taxes mm -hmm. combined, not just income, because at that point, uh, it, it changes the picture uh, quite a bit. Uh, and now Obama says that he hasn't raised taxes on the middle class. His IRS, in fact, has. Uh, when you take away a credit or a deduction, that is effectively a tax increase. Uh, the making work pay credit, if anybody remembers that, up to four or eight hundred dollars for for individuals or couples is is gone this year. Child credits and child care expense re, uh, credits are going down. A few years ago, the first $2,400 in unemployment compensation was not taxable. It has been for the last couple of years. Uh, starting in 2012, teachers don't get their $250 deduction anymore. These are all tax increases and on the middle class, not on the wealthy, because for the most part, the wealthy don't get these, these credits and deductions anyway, something called phase-outs. You may be familiar with them or you may not, but when your income goes up to a certain point, some of these credits including tuition credits and everything else goes away. So the wealthy, it doesn't affect the wealthy when these things go away. Main point here, Romney says he's going to reduce taxes on everybody including the middle class. He's going to knock the top bracket down to 25 percent. That will save billions for, for high-income people. And how is he going to keep it revenue neutral, which he claims he's going to do? He's going to take away all these other deductions and credits, including uh, the home mortgage interest and everything else. He hasn't admitted he's going to do that, but if he wants to keep it new, in, uh, revenue neutral, he has to. So what happens? Middle class people will end up paying more and wealthy people will pay less. According to one study, I didn't run these numbers myself, but I, I have some confidence in them. Uh, middle class people will pay $500 a year more with that plan. Uh, and millionaires will pay $87,000 a year less. So if there's any question where Ram Romney stands, you can look at these numbers and, and run them. And that's, that's what we've got. Uh, what's that? Anyway. Uh, job creators. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're the job creators. Yeah, well, yeah, they, they occasionally create some jobs. Yeah. Uh, and, and they kill jobs. They kill jobs when they, when they cut government programs because many people are, 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 are laid off or fired, not just government employees. Private contractors, people that build things for the government, also lose their jobs. Uh, one last remark regarding Iran. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if Iran is building a nuclear bomb, for, but for their sake, I hope to hell they are. They'd be damned <laughs> fools if they weren't. Uh, and if they ever had any thoughts about compromising and not building it, they should look at what happened to Gaddafi. He voluntarily gave up his nuclear program, right. and look where he is today. We didn't Thank attack you. North Korea. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, well matters. as much as it pains me to, to agree with Union Joe here, I have to agree with him on something. Like the most, I think probably the most important uh, issue was the economy this year. Uh, after that, I would put health care probably, and uh, I don't know what my, I haven't really thought about it enough to see what I put, you know, uh, a after that, but... Uh, yeah, but certainly the economy 
is, is the big factor. And, um, you know, what I would like to see done, which, you know, either, you know, LaRouche and most other parties, you know, don't cover it at all. That's why I brought up love, rent. Uh, is, is, you know, is what we need is a, a massive shift, a, a massive tax shift uh, ta uh, to shift taxes from productive uh, endeavors like, you know, on products and on labor. Uh, we need to shift those taxes to privilege, to which land ownership is. And uh, so in one place I could agree with with uh, the communists on, or Marx like in the Communist Manifesto, one thing they wanted to do is uh, nationalize all land. That's basically what we need to do, although from what I'm gathering from reading, you know, they wanted to like confiscate land, and that's not what Georgism is about. Georgism is about having people that want exclusive use of land to pay for the rent of that land, pay its fair market value to the community, and then the, out of that money, then things would be funded that is appropriate for government function, like uh, oh, really? courts, you know, you know, enforcing contracts and defense. And I'm thinking perhaps, you know, maybe even health care could be uh, uh, funded out of uh, uh, a land tax, or what we call lo location value tax, L you know, LVT. And uh, so you would still own your building. Your people constantly are confusing, uh, you know, buildings and land. They, they want to treat them together as property, but of course, they're not property. And under a Georgia system, you would own your home. You'd have safe possession of your home. As long as you paid the uh, land value tax uh, on you know, your location, you'd be free to live there. But it was, when you don't pay your land value tax, then you'd have to sell your house and, and go. Uh, so you, so it's almost like, you know, think of, it, think of it like having a car. You know, you own your car, but when you park it on a street, you have to pay, you know, for like a parking space for rent. And that money... <laughs> should go to the community. Now, in our case, we privatized it, you know, here in Chicago, but, but you know, most normal places, that's that's how it is. So, and the reason why the law of rent is important is because if we did what everything this gentleman did and say all this this whole, you know, pipe dream, you, you know, Lurushi utopia, you know, everybody's working and making good, solid wages and yada yada yada. And what, what would be the end result? Well, the end result is that the rent would go up. This is what Henry George, you know, figured out, put a fine point on it. Uh, Adam Smith already pinpointed it in 1776 in the, in, uh, uh, the Wealth of Nations. All benefits of a society accrue to the landowners. So what's going to happen is the rent is just going to go up. So people really aren't going to be that much better off. And the law of rent says basically that you know, it's the it's what you can make on the best available free land that that like sets the base, and then what you can make, what, and then for what you know, what given amount of effort and capital you put, you know, you you you, know, you use to make that money on the free land. If you would put that on the next available land, any surplus over what you would have made on the free land goes to rent. So they, the way they explain it, we simply explain it, we call it like, well, there's four land, three land, you know, and two land, and then there's the free land. Four land would be land that with some given uh, effort and capital, you would produce, you would get four units of something. You would make four dollars, or you get four bushels, or four whatever. And your rent would be three, leaving you with one. And the next available land, best available land, would be three land. And with the same amount of capital and effort, you could produce three somethings. And what would your rent be? Landlord's gonna get two, two. and you're gonna be left with one. And then you got the two land, where you're gonna earn two, and the, land, and the rent's gonna be one, so you're gonna have one. And then finally you get to the free land, and you know, you're gonna, whatever you make there, you know, you get, you get to keep, and that's gonna be one. Now, what we look at in Chicago, or elsewhere, is best available free land, for instance, what we like to look at, we use for an example in Henry George School, it's like scrappers. You know, that's what they, they set the base. They're, they're, they have free land, and what they earn you know, for their, uh, their, their labor capital is what they keep. So I could go on and on about more things, but those are uh, uh, where I would go, is move the economy towards uh, location value taxes. <laughs> Oh, I think, oh. <laughs>
Here we go again. Everybody's got a plan to save the world. Right. Everybody's got their own version of wanting to make things better if you just do it my way and we see and you other guys' the solutions are the highway. <laughs> this election to me is a pivotal one. There are some clear choices involved. Do we go the Republican way and privatize Social Security and privatize medical care and do what we have to do? In some cases, there may be a good case for privatization of certain resources to the government. In other cases, it's better to keep the uh, government money in government hands. Let's address the first issue, and that's health care. And I've really done my research into this. We in the United States pay twice as much in administrative expenses and overhead to keep these insurance companies in business. Every other major industrial industrial power that has health care has some form of single payer system. Therefore, it would seem to me that shouldn't we be doing what the rest of the world is doing to do something like this? The next solution to some of our problems around the world. You know, the, sometimes we're talking about things like energy, sources of power. We know renewables are going to be a good solid mix, and we've been seeing that through the development of solar and wind, which is a good thing. But we're also going to need some kind of baseload power. Whatever you think of nuclear, whether it be the thorium-based advocates that I'm advocating, or the U-235 reactor that I'm advocating, or even, as the LaRouche people say, is fusion, it will make sense. For example, when I can put in the fist of my hand the amount of thorium it would take to power my entire life, that to me is scalability. Now it does have costs. There is waste issues. But in any form of power conversion, there is going to be waste issues. The thing that really scares me about this is that if the United States doesn't let us innovate in this area, China and India and other countries will, and we're going to be paying some form of patent rent on these technologies. Especially when it's been the Chinese and the Indians who've been coming to our own government archives and pulling up the old things from Oak Ridge, for example. That's another solution to your problems. About Tweedledum and Tweedledee, the Democratic and Republican parties, around the world they have what they call multi-party democracies, where you have a prime minister and you have coalition buildings amongst various parties and you tend to get a, a little bit more of a messy democracy, but you do have to build a coalition to get governing. And in Europe right now, they're trying their best to bring together the nations that have perpetually been at war for quite a while. And in the United States, we've done that already. We had 13 original countries, so to speak, and we came together under a under a revolution and we were able to form a strong national government. It took us well over a hundred years to get that government with the Civil War and the, finally with the emancipation of the black people to finally get equal rights in the 60s, but it's taken quite a while. The first step that the United States government did after their war debt was the national government came in and assumed all the debts of the states. I see a lot of parallels with Europe today where the European Union should go in and assume the debts of these other countries and make sure that they get a true union and then get control of it over their monetary policy. Let's take a look at the LaRouche people, for example. He talks about other things. But it's, my time is up. 
And um, thank you very much. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Brian, for kicking off. And let's thank our speaker again. We spend a lot of time with our very sincere guy. And I have to, I have to compliment uh, Ron personally. I, uh, you have a commitment to uh, current events and affairs, which, if anything, is commendable to a great many people have no, no cognizance or awareness of what's going on, except possibly once every couple of years and things like this. Um, but see, I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Actually, I came across an amazing thing. There's a thing that's it's put out by Working America, but they offer a very unusual service. Apparently, if you sign up, they will send you an email alerting you that it's election day. <laughs> so you don't miss it. <laughs> so feel dumb shit. <laughs> uh, uh, before we get going here, uh, Joe, you're entirely correct. Uh, I give a lecture on which the unions, you talked about Taft-Hartley. The unions in the United States were legal, in fact, for a period of only 12 years, 1935 to 47. The rest of the time, they're in fact have been operating, but operating outside of the law, I would say that. And the end result is what I could perceive to be the number one issue in this uh, election is social stratification. Uh, you may say it comes about it as taxation, uh, but it certainly is. And oddly enough, the issue was perpetrated by the Republican Party through his inadvertent comments. Uh, he faced an uphill thing. Uh, he's certainly living in a mansion, and this goofy wife of his with this pony and things like this. The, these, these people have money at, at a time of many people have no money and a lot of people are being made, being evicted and things like this. And you read about, can you imagine being evicted and the guy threw it out of his house because he just wanted another bigger one? I mean, I just don't know how you confront this situation. <laughs> you know. um, you know, uh, the, the thing about the Middle East is, quite honestly, I, I, like, I like foreign affairs. I, I, I've been a member of the UN Association for a number of years. However, I kind of don't, I don't read anything about the Middle East anymore. Or certainly not assiduously. It seems to be an endless, endless thing. And I really don't need any additional information about this seemingly, this, this whole situation, this is, it's reached the saturation point with at least me personally. Now, I'm sorry that the employees of the State Department came under harm's way. However, if you've taken assignment in this Middle Eastern situation, let's just say it's not the same as being assigned to the embassy in Lithuania. <laughs> you know, it, this is tragic situation here. It was an incident. Go get the guys. They are not going to have a nuclear war as a result of this. It's certainly not justification and provocation for things like that. Um, you know, whether or not the United States as a nation, the other thing about the Republicans regarding the election, whether or not we are in debt, indebted to the small businessmen, to me, is kind of a bizarre premise. <laughs> um, they're, they're big guys who made big industries like Ford and running big things like this and that's what we unionized and some of these guys that own like like shoe shine stands or you know I mean I, I don't know if that's what drives the American economy. The other thing about Henry George, we're talking about some heavy duty issue here is whether or not we're gonna take from the rich and give to the poor. And you're advocating, I'm sorry, like a flat tax. And that's not gonna work. Okay. That's not what we want. That's not gonna achieve it. Is it? Works in Hong Kong. Is it going to take this, a rich motherfucker like Romney and take his money and distribute it among the poor and needy? No, it isn't. We want some immediate action like Ernie was talking about. You know, we want some, we want some action. And in other words, we're getting tired of it, you know. 
where everyone's working harder and, the, and getting less ahead. You know, that's the bottom line here, man. Okay. And some kind of scheme like this, that's just a flat tax. No, it's not. It's that's all it is. It's got a rent going into your private landlord. Anyhow, I got no time. We'll take it up. I got something else right here. Anyhow, where do you go? Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. All right, so I understand we have to be out of here at 11. Um, there's um, one thing that's quite obvious if people kind of reflect on, on all the comments. Um, nobody got beyond their own ideologies that they already had. Nobody actually addressed the fact that the entire financial system is disintegrating like Germany in 1923. So all of the notions that we're going to do this and that on taxes, and that is really um, not what's on the agenda. And nobody actually seemed to make the connection uh, to keep the wars separate from the collapse. So we come back to what's going on in the Middle East, when the only way you're going to s stabilize the Middle East is build some water projects in there where all the six nations around there develop water and power and move forward. And you can't do that without Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall is not some little banking reform. We have to give up our ideologies and do a little work. Glass-Steagall is a fundamental distinction between an empire policy of monetarism versus a credit policy in development. It's what the United States was built on. It's been a fight ever since. And everybody who traped up here to say various things got caught in their own little version of monetarism. Uh, or ideology. They went right back to the yeah, same thing yeah. that they've been repeating and repeating and repeating and you're no longer in that situation. And if you need some external proof to prove you're not in that situation, this is not in Libya about us now going getting the guys who did it. We're the guys who did it. So you know we've got to take a real deep breath and say just what the heck is running our country and running our lives and we keep nodding and have our own ideological spin but we never get out of the monitor's box. We never get to directed credit for production. We talk about how it should be better and people should go to work but we don't do a damn thing to actually get that done like building the WAPA. Huh. So you put this Nawapa program in. We need the water. We need the, uh, the tables rebuilt. We got fires burning in front of our face, water tables dropping, no crops, you know. We stand here and we talk about green policies and we got 50% of the corn crop going into fuel at the time we're losing our dairy herds and other farms. And we say we're sane. So what we should take home here tonight is two things. One, LaRouche's webcast that just went on last night. The site is larouchepack.com. Go in there and rather than having the media for 40 years now make your own decision, actually look at some content and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then when you have to say something, don't spin a rhetoric, don't make it up like you went to uh, SMU, you know, that LaRouche is this, he's a Pro Trotskyist and all this, you make it up, you know. You can pick people out of the crowd, they all went to MSU, what's that mean? Make shit up. <laughs> you know, it's just ridiculous. And for 40 years, they follow their professor who said it 40 years ago, and there's not a new idea going on. And somebody said, and I'll end with this, there is one fact. There's a fact. And the fact is that the human race, we as human beings, are different than the animals. And we can give up our little fixations and ideologies any time we decide to say, damn, my ass is on the line. And then we actually put through Glass-Steagall. You want something that's immediate and you can change everything? Put through Glass-Steagall and run that credit system putting people to work. And where are you going to find that? Well, the only person in place that's been putting it out, Lyndon LaRouche. Now, he's 90 years old, he's not running, but you can actually force it as an issue. And then we can deal with all these other things. It's not about what candidate. It's whether we're going to take our nation back and start thinking. And you're not going to solve it overnight, but we can put through Glass-Steagall overnight. We can put House Bill 107 through overnight and take this president off these buttons. We can create a political situation that opens this debate up in the media and on the debates and through politics. 
as opposed to pretending as it didn't happen. And go home and use the only tool you got. You got LaRouche's webcast there, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, pick it up and use it. It's LaRouchePack.com. And if you want, you can get my number, you can call me. But we can do this, provided we actually break our own little ideologies. Where every time it's the same thing, back to the same subject, when the <laughs> whole universe is in front of us to shift. So we got to go to thermonuclear fusion. We got to have Glass Steagall to credit it. And everything we credit at that level, it's going to pay for itself as we build it. So don't worry about the debt. Cancel the bogus debt, and let's build our way out of this. Thank you. All right. Close this out, Brom. Close this out, Brom. I want to thank not only our speaker, but all of you who came, especially those who have participated. How about the people who hold the other government?